Good afternoon. My name is David Gallo. I'm the head of the AIFC Academy of Law. And welcome to all of our participants uh, in today's webinar. Uh, as you well know by now, the Academy of Law has been hosting complimentary learning and development webinars almost on a daily basis. We have two or three a week, and we're very pleased to be able to offer this service to, uh, to you and our other stakeholders at the Academy. First and foremost, I hope, we hope that you are safe and well and making the best of your time uh, during this highly um, unusual set of circumstances that we find ourselves in. So um, we, we hope that these events uh, add a bit of um, education, positive distraction, um, and, uh, and, and certainly a remedy against cabin fever that I know we are all experiencing in, in some shape. So, so welcome. Um, okay, so we have with us Professor Mark Moore from University College London. For those who, you, who did not participate in last week's event, this is the second lecture uh, delivered by Professor Moore in a series of four lectures. And recall that the overarching theme of this series is an introduction to AIFC business law and practice. Last week's lecture was uh, an overview of corporate law, uh, pretty much the common law perspective on that. Not so much the AIFC version, but more of the, 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 the theory and the principles uh, underlying corporate law from in the, in the common law tradition. Today's topic is corporate finance and capital markets. Um, actually a very compelling topic in the context of the, the various things that go on within the AIFC jurisdiction. Um, next week, April 29th, um, is part three, which is insolvency and business restructuring. And then there will be a fourth lecture on May 6th, dispute resolution and remedies. Uh, Professor Moore will be uh, leading the charge on all of those. So with that, let's get started. Let me just mention that uh, during the lecture, you are free to activate your um, question uh, raising capability. Down at the bottom of the screen, you can, there's a little icon to raise your hand if you have a question. Please click that icon if you do have a question. We will pick that up and we will activate your microphone so that you can ask a question of Professor Moore. And then also at the end of Professor Moore's lecture today, he will open it up for 10 or 15 minutes, whatever we need for general Q&A. And again, you can uh, activate your uh, question um, icon if you have a, a question at the end. Okay, so with that, uh, let me turn the floor over to Professor Mark Moore, who will address the topic of corporate finance and capital markets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as David said, this is an especially compelling topic, uh, not just from the perspective of AIFC, uh, but also globally at the moment, because uh, capital markets uh, have been in an unprecedented state of turmoil uh, for, for a variety of reasons, mainly as a result of the, the catastrophic effect on, on world markets, uh, which has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and also, actually, uh, in the last few days, uh, the more pressing issue for global markets has actually been the, the, the related catastrophic fall in global oil prices, which haven't just affected oil and commodities markets, but they've affected all markets around the world, all uh, financial markets, including uh, equity markets, uh, markets for corporate shares. So these have been real major issues. So it's an especially, uh, an especially pertinent, convenient time, I think, to be, to be talking about these issues. Now, corporate finance and capital markets is it's an incredibly interesting area. It's also a very opaque or unclear area of law. Even experienced lawyers who are used to dealing with commercial transactions can often have questions about what these transactions really mean. In order to effectively deal with corporate and financial transactions, it's extremely useful to know not just the relevant law, but also why those transactions are taking place uh, and you know, why companies are raising the forms of finance that they are. 
so that we can put our legal knowledge within a broader frame of understanding. Because to be an effective business lawyer, you don't just need to know the law, you also need to have a good sense of the business and market context in which those laws are being used. And that's hopefully what we can try to grasp today uh, in some way. Uh, so uh, to begin with today, looking at uh, corporate finance, capital markets, uh, a couple of foundational issues actually. First of all, what is corporate finance? It's a term that's used very frequently. Uh, global law firms around the world uh, have corporate finance departments. It's an especially popular, especially lucrative area of legal practice. What does corporate finance actually entail? Fundamentally, you know, to put it in short, corporate finance is essentially how companies raise money, how companies raise money to finance their business operations. And companies will raise money uh, in various ways, some of those uh, more common than others. Uh, so here I have a, a brief summary of the main forms of corporate finance, most of which, or at least some of which, you will probably be familiar with. So the two classic forms of corporate finance are equity and debt. And this is for corporations of all shapes and sizes. The typical issue a company has, particularly when it's starting up, is how do we finance ourselves? How, do we, how, how, how will the business be funded? Now, as I explained briefly last week, one way to go about doing this is to raise equity or what's known as risk capital. A company raises equity by issuing shares, in particular by issuing ordinary shares. Now, equity is sometimes known as risk capital because there's always an inherent element of risk. There's an inherent level of risk with any capital, but especially with equi equity capital, because equity capital involves what's sometimes known as an open-ended contract. When I agree to become a shareholder of a company, I am putting my money in that company, and I do not know what I will be getting back from the company. Typically, I will have no contractually specified rate of return on my investment. Rather, how much money I get back, what specific rate of return I get in my investment, lies at the discretion of the company and in particular its board of directors. Therefore, uh, equity capital involves a particular element of risk. Debt finance is typically seen as a, a a less risky form of finance, at least from an investor's point of view. Because with debt finance, typically the person advancing the money, the finance, knows what the rate of return will be because they're able to specify that in a contract. Also with debt finance, there's typically other ways in which an investor can protect themselves. Most obviously by taking security over the assets of the, the, the company or other business that they're funding. Whereas with equity finance, uh, when someone advances equity finance, uh, they will typically not take security. Uh, and therefore, that adds to the riskiness of that particular form of finance. A good way to explain the difference between these two types of finance is to think of a, a non-business scenario. Uh, imagine you're in a position where you need to fund something Let's say, for example, you want to go back to college or university and you need money to be able to fund your degree. How would you do that? Well, one option might be to go to a commercial lender, to go to a, a bank and to ask the bank to provide you with some sort of finance. Another option might be if you're fortunate enough to have family wealth to turn to, you may look to your family to fund you. Now, debt finance is the going to the bank. You go to the bank and you will be given, a, you, 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 you will be offered a degree of credit on very specific terms, usually with a very specific repayment schedule. If you fail to meet that repayment schedule, you will be in default and there will be a range of remedies that the bank will be able to use to recoup their money. Now, equity finance in a way 
it's almost like going to members of a family for funding. You might take a notional loan from your parents or from other family members. However, the terms on which you pay that loan back are somewhat open-ended. There's a general expectation that the money will be paid back someday in some shape or form, but there's more flexibility. If you're not making much money for the first couple of years after you finish your course, you can maybe defer repayment further down the line. And then when you finally get the job that you've been looking for and you start to make a good income, then you can start paying a higher rate of return depending on your individual circumstances. Well, equity capital to a company is a bit like parental or family funding from the point of view of an individual. There's a general sense that the investment should be repaid by the company, that there should be a rate of return on the investment. But usually it's open-ended and there's no definite requirement. So from the point of view of a business, equity finance is more flexible, more risky from the point of view of the investor. But it's, it's, it's more convenient from the point of view of the business because it typically gives the business more breathing space. Of course, equity investors do not provide that flexibility for free. They will ask for something in return. Typically what they'll ask for in return is a say over how the business is governed. And usually they will do this by demanding voting rights. So when you buy an ordinary share in a company, you typically do not have a fixed rate of return on your investment. But what you do have is you do have the right to have a say over who sits on the board of directors of the company, because you have a right to vote on who the company's directors will be. If you're a lender providing debt finance, you typically don't have that right unless you specifically negotiate for it. So that's the key difference really between these two forms of finance. Now, these are very much the end points, the extreme points of the spectrum. And if we see equity on one side of the spectrum as the most flexible form of finance and debt finance on the other side of the spectrum as the most rigid, unflexible form of finance from a, from a business point of view, what we will see, of course, is a great number of hybrid or what we sometimes call mezzanine forms of finance that have got some characteristics of equity and some characteristics of debt. And what specific, you know, where a, where a company's financing sits in that spectrum very much depends on the particular needs of its business at any point in time. And we'll look at some of those more common hybrid or mezzanine forms of financing a little later. But one thing that's not to be forgotten is companies don't just need to raise finance to fund their operations. Many companies hardly ever in fact, sometimes never need to go to the outside markets, whether equity markets or debt markets to raise finance, because they already have the money. They already have the money in the form of retained earnings or profit. Uh, so we sometimes think of finance that companies raise from the markets as outside finance, because they have to go out to the market, they have to go out to investors to try and entice them to provide that money. But actually, most of the money that companies typically finance themselves on is money they've already got, what we would sometimes call inside capital, the retained earnings or profit. That's not just the case for closely held private companies. It's also the case for public companies as well, whose shares are traded on a, uh, on a regulated stock exchange. Uh, just to give you an illustration of the amounts of retained earnings that some companies have, uh, the total amount of global corporate cash reserves, so this is money companies have got in the form of retained earnings, has been estimated, on the most recent figures I have, it's been estimated at $7 trillion. Not million, not billion, trillion. $7 trillion is the amount of money that corporations globally have in the form of retained earnings. That's an incredible amount of money. So you can see why you know, many companies don't have to go to market that often to raise money, just they've already got it. 
Does anybody, can anybody guess now, uh, Jeff, this is where I may need you to, to be prepared to turn on a microphone because I'm about to ask a question. So do please raise your hand virtually if you'd like to, to, to hazard a guess. And please don't use your, your internet browser. Don't cheat and spoil the fun. Can anybody tell me who you think the world's biggest corporate cash hoarder is? In other words, what corporation in the world has got the biggest amount of retained earnings? I'll give you a clue. It's an American company, and it's a tech company, a well-known tech company. Anybody hazard a guess? Who is the world's richest corporation in terms of the amount of its cash reserves? Oh, I've got a hand. Uh, so this is the third. I've got a couple of hands. I'm going to take uh, the first one I saw. Uh, Jeff, I think it's the third name on the list. Uh, is it? Uh, it's it's in Russian characteristics. So I'm not sure I can pronounce it. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, could you mute the microphone for the third person on the list? The first person who has a hand raised. Yeah, yeah have some Dorian, 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 please. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, this is Apple Corporation. It's not biggest... Apple. Yeah, actually, it was Apple in the past. It's not Apple now. Apple have have lost that title. Uh, do we have uh, another? Uh, we had another hand. Uh, Nurkat's got his hand raised. I think there was an, another one, but I think I've lost the other hand. Uh, oh, yeah, Ku Kuyanish. Kuyanish. Uh, fifth name on the list. Could we unmute, unmute that microphone? Yep. Um, yeah. Hello, everybody. I think it's Amazon. It's not Amazon either. <laughs> uh, it's not Amazon. Although you would think it was Amazon, just given the sheer amount of uh, receivables uh, that they have. Uh, it's, 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 it's the other one, I guess. Uh, Nur, is Nurkat there? Can we unmute Nurkat? Uh, third on the list, I think. Third on my list. Uh -huh, yes. Is it Google? It is Google, yeah. We got there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Google, strictly speaking, it's actually Alphabet. Alphabet is Google's parent company, its holding company, and its group. But yeah, essentially Google, Alphabet or Google, uh, they're the world's biggest corporate cash hoarder. But in response to the other two uh, people, uh, Amazon and Apple are certainly not far off. Apple, I believe, used to be before Google took over in the last couple of years. Uh, so Alphabet or Google's total amount of retained earnings as of 2019 uh, is 117 billion US dollars, 117 billion dollars. Uh, just to put that in perspective, this is bigger than the respective GDPs of Ecuador, Kenya, Sri Lanka, and the Ukraine. Uh, it's 65% of Kazakhstan's GDP, and it's over double, over double the GDP of Uzbekistan. So we are talking incredible, incredible amounts of money. You know, large corporations are small countries. And in fact, not just small countries, large corporations are quite large countries in terms of their, their, uh, their, their, their financial power, the amount of wealth they hold. So when you look at, uh, when you look at the stock market indices uh, on another window, uh, because I, I do a small bit of amateur trading myself, on another window just now on my laptop, I've got uh, the, uh, stock, the European stock market indices up at the moment. Thankfully, they're flashing green because it's a, it's a bull market day today, whereas yesterday they were all flashing red because it was a bear market day. Prices were going down due to the oil crash. But uh, the important thing to note is many people think when you see all these numbers, all these stock prices changing all the time, money is going into companies. Google and Apple and Amazon are getting money. They're not, they're not, none of that money that you see in those screens is actually going into the companies. The only time when the company actually gets any of that money is when it, when it actually issues shares or other securities. When it engages in what's called an IPO, an initial public offering, or a secondary or tertiary public offering if it goes back to market. So when the company initially raises funds by issuing its shares, 
that's when it gets the money. But actually, all of these billions, in fact, trillions of transactions that we see on stock markets every day, none of that money is going into the companies. These are purely secondary market transactions between existing shareholders. It's just money changing hands from, from, from one investor to the other. But uh, it's not affecting really the company's uh, capital because they've already got the money. So that's an important thing to note. Uh, when, we, when we think about capital markets, that distinction between primary and secondary markets are really important. Uh, once the, the, the vast, vast majority of transactions are secondary market, it's only a small minority that are primary market transactions where the company is actually directly involved themselves. So that's just a, a, a broad overview of main forms of corporate finance. Now, another important distinction to grasp and another important piece of terminology is, is these terms, liquid and illiquid. Uh, which you may have come across before. Basically, a liquid form of corporate security is, by the way, the word security here can mean two things. When we're talking about debt finance, if somebody is lending money to a business, they will commonly take security in the form of a charge or mortgage over the, the, the borrowing company's assets. Now, we're not concerned with that form of security. We're going to talk about that next week when we look at insolvency. But corporate security can also mean another thing as well, and it's important not to confuse them. The word security in the corporate finance world is also used to basically refer to any, any, uh, any rights that somebody has uh, to a return uh, to, 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 to return on an investment from a company. So if I buy a share in the company, I acquire a bundle of rights. I acquire rights to occasionally share in the profits of the company through receipt of dividend payments. I acquire the right to vote in the company's general meeting to decide who its directors will be, amongst other things. And that bundle of rights I have is known as my security. These are the rights I can use against the company. So shares are a form of security interest. Also, uh, debt instruments are a form of security interest as well because they, 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 they give you that bundle of rights you can use against the company. Now, uh, security interest can be liquid or illiquid. Uh, now, maybe start with illiquid actually, the bottom point. Illiquid forms of corporate security interest cannot readily be converted into cash. Liquidity means the ability of something to be converted quickly into cash. So somebody could be very wealthy, but actually they could still starve because they have no liquidity. In order to be able to live, in order to be able to have any standard of living as a person or as a business, it's not enough to be wealthy. The wealthiest person in the world could still starve to death because even though they have great wealth, they have no liquidity. Somebody may have millions and millions of dollars stored up in the form of real estate and estates and, 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 and uh, landed property. But if none of that property can be realized and converted into cash, they won't be able to feed themselves and live. So liquidity is almost as important as wealth itself. Now, there are many forms of corporate security that are illiquid. You cannot convert them into cash, or at least you can, but you'll have, you'll have, you'll have great difficulty doing so. Well, for example, if I'm the controlling shareholder in a company and I have a majority equity stake, in a certain sense, that's very good because I've got governance control over the company. But actually, there's very few people that will be able to afford to buy a controlling equity stake in a company because it involves a lot of money, which not many people have. So controlling shareholdings are typically a relatively illiquid form of capital. Likewise, a bank loan. Uh, if I'm a bank and I've lent money to your business, I've got a security interest because I've got a set of rights to repayment of my capital and interest. Now, 
I can try and sell those rights on, but actually it will be difficult for me to assign those rights. Legally, it won't be difficult to assign those rights to another individual. Certainly at common law, it's relatively straightforward as a lender to assign the rights you have against the debtor to a third party. However, from a, from a practical point of view, there's not many people that would be willing to take on that level of risk exposure because if the debtor goes insolvent, if they go bankrupt or insolvent, then that money is not going to be paid back and the lender will have to take that hit. So I have to find somebody that has got the financial capacity to be able to absorb that risk of lending a large amount of money to one individual borrower, whether an individual or a business. Now, with liquid forms of corporate security interest, those problems do not arise. Classic forms of liquid corporate security interest would typically be a share or a minority shareholding in a company, particularly a publicly traded company. Because you know that if things are not working out as you hope, the company is not doing particularly well and it, the, 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 the price of its shares is falling, you can sell those shares. Now, you might have to take a loss on the shares. You might have to sell them for lower than you bought them for. But that's just a risk that's part and parcel of being an equity investor. But the key point is you can get out. You do have an exit door which you may not necessarily have if your investment is illiquid. Likewise, with liquid debt securities. Liquid debt securities uh, are typically issued in the form of bonds. A bond is almost like a loan. It's like a parcel. It's like a portion of a loan. If a company wants to borrow a very, very large amount of money, we're talking millions or sometimes billions of dollars, they're not going to find anyone willing to lend them that money in one chunk because the level of risk, for a start, not many individuals or institutions have that money to lend. And also, even if they do have that money to lend, a seven or eight figure debt in the form of a single illiquid loan involves considerable risk for the lender because if the borrower defaults, then you know, they're, they're, they're in almost as much trouble as the, as the borrower. If, if the debt becomes bad and cannot be repaid. Therefore, bonds are a very helpful way of financing especially large capital outlays. So if the borrower wants to borrow millions or possibly billions of dollars, what they can do, instead of going to one commercial bank and asking for a loan, they can issue bonds. They can issue small debt, small parcels of debt security, which means in turn, they can take individual parcels of debt from a large amount of investors, and therefore that risk is spread widely. So when you see, for example, large public companies issuing debt, it will typically be in the form of bond issues rather than in the form of uh, you know, individual bank loans for, for that reason. Uh, so these are just some important terms to be aware of. Now, I did mention earlier that as well as equity and debt, the classic forms of security. There are lots of different hybrid or mezzanine forms of finance that share characteristics of both equity and debt. Now, there's an almost limitless range of possibilities here. Uh, but uh, before we go on to, to talk about them, it, it is useful just to recap on what the key features of debt and equity finance are. So when it comes to debt finance, sometimes referred to it as loan finance, but it doesn't always have to be in the form of loans, remember, it could be in the form of bonds. These are the typical features, really, which I think have mainly been over already. Uh, debt financiers, lenders, typically don't have the opportunity to share in the profits of the company over and above their agreed rate of return. So once they've got their agreed capital and interest paid, they don't typically share in the profits of the company unless they have what are called convertible securities, which could be converted to equity, which we'll talk about in a moment. With the equity or risk finance, we have a completely different set of characteristics. Uh, one other interest, interesting distinction is debt, debt finance typically has a finite life. If you finance a company through debt, uh, then that debt will be advanced 
for a finite limited time period because there will be a period of time when the creditor, the lender or bondholder expects their money to be repaid in full. Now with equity finance, if you're issuing shares to an investor, uh, then equity finance will typically be provided for an infinite time period. So there is no repayment debt that sorry, there is no repayment date that applies to a company's ordinary shareholders. They will get the money back as and when the company is able to pay it. If the company is in bad times and cannot pay a dividend to the ordinary shareholders, then the ordinary shareholders have to take a hit. If the company goes into insolvent liquidation and cannot pay the ordinary shareholders back their capital, then the ordinary shareholders are at the very end of the queue. They ultimately take the hit. They lose an investment. So if you buy shares in a company and the company goes into liquidation, you've just got to write your investment off. You've lost that money. Uh, the chances of you getting that money back are next to zero because once all the secured and unsecured creditors have been paid, the chances of the company having anything left to pay you are minimal in most cases. Uh, so these are just common characteristics of both these forms of finance. Now there are, as I said, an almost limitless amount of hybrid or mezzanine forms of finance a company could raise. These are just three particularly common ones that I've decided to, to, to pick up on. So last week I said something about the importance of preference shares. Preference shares are in most markets the second most common form of, of share that a company will issue behind ordinary shares. Preference shares are in many ways a classic form of hybrid or mezzanine finance because they've got some characteristics of equity, some characteristics of debt. In many ways actually they're closer to debt securities than equity securities because of course with preference shares the dividend rate that shareholders are entitled to is typically fixed and it will usually be a fixed percentage of the company's nominal share capital. So if the company is registered with a nominal share capital of let's say $100,000 and you have an 8% preference share then you would be entitled to 8% of that $100,000 nominal capital each year. Uh, so which would be, what would that be, $8,000. So you know that you will get your $8,000 as long as the company's got the money to, to pay you. Uh, the difference between preference shares and debt is that uh, with standard debt, if the company is unable to pay you your $8,000 this year, then the company is in default and you then have rights to take action under your contract with the, with, the lend, with the borrower. So if the company is unable to pay for $8,000 any year, you can then take recovery actions to enforce your right to full repayment typically and demand that the company pays the full $100,000 or else potentially you could put them into liquidation. Now with preference shares, that's not the case. If the company does not have the money to pay you your $8,000 dividend this year, then that entitlement rolls over and it accumulates next year, which means next year the company, presume, assuming of course it's recovered its fortunes, the company will then have to pay you $16,000 next year. And if they can't pay you next year, then they'll have to pay you $24,000 the following year because that $8,000 will roll over every year. So preference shares do provide more flexibility than standard debt, but clearly less flexibility than ordinary shares. Because if it was ordinary shares the company had issued, wouldn't have to pay the shareholders anything at all. The shareholders of course could fire the board if they were particularly annoyed, but short of that extreme action, it's not a great deal the ordinary shareholders can really do. Now, there are other forms of hybrid security, which are quite common in practice. So I mentioned earlier the importance of convertible securities. The classic form of convertible security would be a, a convertible bond. Uh, so a company 
might want to raise finance. It might not have a great track record. So it might struggle to raise equity finance because it's relatively unknown and not many investors are willing to take the risk of buying ordinary shares. So what the company might do is it might issue bonds, it might issue debt instruments, but render them convertible, which means after a few years, the investor who buys the security has got the option of converting the bond into an equity security, in other words, into a, an ordinary share, which means the company is able to raise the finance. After a few years, the company then gets the flexibility of having its debt obligations converted into equity securities, which means it gets more breathing space to develop its business. Whereas uh, the investor, in theory, should be willing to trust the company's management more by that stage, in which case they may be more happy to take ordinary shares, equity securities. A variant on that is where a company issues warrants, which basically means uh, the, the, the the debt financier acquires debt securities initially. They keep those debt securities, but at some point in time, they also have the right to become shareholders as well by exercising their warrants to buy shares. More attractive from the investor's point of view, but obviously somewhat less attractive from the point of view of the business because there's less flexibility there because it doesn't actually get rid of the debt obligations. And another particularly common form of hybrid or mezzanine finance uh, is what have actually become quite common in the last few weeks in the, uh, in the wake of uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is subordinated debt securities, sometimes known as junk bonds, use the American banking terminology. Uh, subordinated debt securities or junk bonds would typically be low-grade debt securities that would be issued by a company. Uh, uh, and they will typically rank behind other debt securities in the event of default. So if the company, for example, goes into liquidation uh, and it's insolvent, so it does not have the money to pay all its creditors, if you have a subordinated debt security or a junk bond, uh, you will rank behind all the other creditors, but usually above the shareholders. So it carries a little less risk than an ordinary share, but considerably more risk than other debt securities, which means uh, the rate of return on junk bonds will typically be higher than it will be on higher grade debt securities, uh, obviously because of the, the, the higher risk involved that the company has to pay for. Uh, and there's lots of other forms as well. These are just some of the most common ones. Uh, other points to note are uh, it's very common to talk about a company's shareholders as being the owners of the company. And in some respects, we might say they are akin to owners, at least in so far as the risk exposure is concerned. Uh, if you hear CEOs of, 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 of traded companies, particularly in America, given presentations, they will sometimes talk about how they're accountable to their owners. We're accountable to make profit for the owners of our company, the shareholders. Actually, legally speaking, shareholders do not own companies. What do shareholders own? Shareholders own shares, but ownership of shares does not actually give you ownership of the company. If I acquire a minority stake in a company, if I buy, in fact, funnily enough, if I, if I buy as I did yesterday, if I buy one share in Walt Disney Corporation, the reason I bought one share in Walt Disney Corporation was not necessarily for a, from a financial point of view. It was because my elder daughter, who loves Disney films, really wanted to, be, to become an owner of Disney. So I told her, if I buy one share, we own Disney. So I was, actually, I was actually telling this myth to my own daughter uh, to please her, but it's not true. Legally, it's not true. If I own one share in the Disney Corporation, I've got no right to come to their, their, their studios in, in Orlando or California and, uh, and, and, and take, one, take, you know, take one share's worth of assets. 
ownership of shares does not translate into ownership of the physical asset of the company. What I get when I buy a share in a company is rights, hold certain defined legal rights, the right to have a say, a fractional say in the appointment of the board of the company, and also the right to receive a fractional share of the company's profit in the form of dividends. But other than that, there's not much else I can really do as a shareholder, apart from sell my shares if I'm not happy. So ownership of shares does not translate into ownership of the company. Uh, even if I have 100% of the shares in a company, I don't strictly own the company. What I do have, of course, is the right to completely take over the running of the company. But who owns the company? Strictly speaking, the answer to that question is the company owns the company. The company as a legal entity is the only person that owns the business. Ownership of shares is separate from ownership of the business, albeit ownership of the shares gives you important influence over the running of the business. Uh, other things to note, of course, shares come in all different shapes and forms, all different classes. These are just some of the most common classes of shares. That we see. Uh, I've already mentioned ordinary shares or equities. If you're following US financial development, you will commonly hear about common stock. Common stock is just the American word for ordinary shares. In England, we tend to use the term ordinary shares, but common stock means the same thing. Preference shares I've already spoken about. If you're following the US finance news, you'll commonly hear the term preferential stock. Preferential stock is essentially the American word for preference shares. Convertible shares I've already mentioned. Stock, by the way, is a kind of American-esque synonym for shares. In the UK, we talk about shares. In the US, the word stock tends to be used. Stock actually, in its literal sense, means something much wider. Stock is a word for any capital deployed in a business. But Often, as a matter of common practice, it's used as another word for shares. Uh, deferred shares would be shares which rank even further behind others on the insolvency of the business. So a deferred shareholder would get the right to repayment of their investment after the ordinary shareholders had been paid on the liquidation of the business. So deferred shares obviously carry even more risk than, than ordinary shares. Therefore, they're, they're not so common because, as you can imagine, they're not a particularly attractive offering for investors. Redeemable shares, however, are common and they are very valuable. A redeemable share, the, the, the third bottom point on the list, a redeemable is share is a share that will be issued with a redemption right. So typically either party will have the unilateral right to, 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 well, the shareholder will have the right to basically uh, to, 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 uh, to recall their capital, to give their shares back to the company and uh, to, to, to get their investment back. Whereas the company will have the right to demand uh, that the, the shareholder gives their shares back to the company uh, if they no longer want the obligation of having to pay out on those shares. Uh, so if, if you're issuing preference shares, it could be advantageous to the company to issue them on a redeemable basis. So if you don't want to have to keep paying them, you can redeem them again. Also relatively common, more in the US than in other jurisdictions, is non-voting shares or shares with limited voting rights, which I said a little bit about, I think, in the, the Q&A last week. So uh, a lot of the big American tech companies, that we, that we, some of which were mentioned earlier, uh, Alphabet or Google being a good example. Uh, not Amazon and Apple, actually. Amazon and Apple uh, are not uh, dual-class companies. Uh, Google are an example of a, of a dual-class company. In fact, they're a triple-class company now. Alphabet or Google issue three classes of shares. Google A shares, B shares, and C shares. Uh, their A shares carry 10 votes each and are exclusively held by their, their founders, uh, that's uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, and uh, Facebook are similar as well. Their A shares carry 10 votes each and are exclusively held by their founder, Mark Zuckerberg. 
Uh, Google and I believe Facebook also issue B and C shares. Their B shares carry only one vote each and are held by their outside investors. So they're ordinary investors. They're not involved in running the company. And their C shares carry zero votes. They're actually non-voting shares. Why would a company have such a structure? Well, it, it insulates the founders against interference from outside. So if I'm Mark Zuckerberg and I want to build up Facebook, and I don't want hedge funds and other outside investors interfering in my running of the company. If I give them one vote each, or some of them I actually give zero votes if they buy class C shares, and I keep my 10 votes per share, that means that I'm effectively insulated from outside challenge. Because what it means is that Mark Zuckerberg and his associates are together able to retain vote control over Facebook Corporation, even though their actual economic interest in the company is only in the region, I think, of about 14, 15%. But they're able to get majority voting control because of their weighted voting rights, their 10 votes per share. Uh, now, you might say, well, I can see why it's attractive for the founder, for the entrepreneur. Why would that be attractive for the outside investor? Why as an outside investor would I take one vote per share or even zero votes per share? Uh, if I was investing in a company like Facebook or Alphabet, well, you might think it makes no sense, but believe me, investors do. They are willing to do it. If you trust the founder well enough, you will be prepared to buy shares on extremely disadvantageous terms because you trust that the company will still be governed in a profitable way. Of course, the company will pay more or more accurately, you as an investor will pay less. Google and Alphabet's class B and C, B and C shares will, will trade at a materially lower value than their, uh, than, their, than their class A shares because of the lower votes attached to them. Uh, and a final category is employee shares. Companies will sometimes issue shares to employees usually in the basis that employees who have got an ownership interest in the company or, or, or a, a type of ownership interest uh, are more likely to, to be productive uh, and hardworking and to relate to the company's overall goals. Now, companies that issue employee shares usually won't just give employees straight shares because then the, the shares could, could be sold and then the, 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 all those incentive benefits for the company are taken away. So usually when companies issue employee shares, they will typically be issued to a, a, a special trust fund that will then hold those shares on the employee's behalf and exercise votes on the shares uh, on behalf of the employees collectively. So that's just another type of share to be aware of. And there's many other forms. These are just the most common. Now, to, 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 to draw towards the close one, one other piece of terminology I mentioned earlier is this idea of the company's nominal share capital. Now, a company's nominal share capital, that's basically the amount of capital that the company is formed with. So if I form a company and I've got $100,000 to invest in the company of my own money, my own risk capital, I will subscribe for $100,000 of shares. I will put my $100,000 in the company and that $100,000 will be known as the company share capital. Now, that money cannot be returned to the shareholders. You can use it in the ordinary course of the company's business, but you cannot return it to the shareholders because that's the money the shareholders put up, essentially as a kind of cushion of protection for the creditors in the event that the company goes into liquidation if its business fails. Now, if you are forming a public company in the AIFC, uh, you do need a minimum share capital of at least 100,000 US dollars, but only if you're forming a public company. So if you want to trade the company shares on the AIX or any other exchange, you will have to register it as a public company and you will have to put $100,000 into it. However, if you're not going to trade the company shares, if you're if, 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 if you're happy for those shares to be held within close quarters and not traded in a public market, you can form a private company. And in the AIFC, like here in the UK, 
there's no minimum share capital amount for private companies. A private company can be formed with a share capital of one dollar, one cent, if you wish. Uh, if you look at major trading corporations in the US, they typically have par values in their shares of fractions of a dollar, 0.0001 dollars in some case. They're kept as low as possible. Now, why would you why would you have a very low uh, nominal share capital? Well, if you don't have money to invest in the company yourself, and you're funding the company entirely through debt finance, for example, through bank loans, you don't need a high share capital. Uh, now, uh, there are some countries in the world, particularly in continental Europe, that do have high share capital requirements, even for private companies. So for example, if you want to form a, a private company in Germany, you will need a minimum share capital of 25,000 euros. If you want to form a private company in Austria, there's a minimum share capital requirement of 35,000 euros. So what that means, if you're in Germany and you want to form a company, if you don't have 25,000 euros to spare, essentially you can't form a company. So it puts a threshold, a wealth threshold, in terms of who can form companies. The counter argument is, well, it provides more security to creditors because creditors know that, you know, that, that, that it's not just anyone who can form a company. Uh, you, you do actually have to put a minimum amount of money on the line, which arguably, in theory, gives creditors more peace of mind. But in, here in the UK, and also where you are, uh, at least in the AISE jurisdiction, there's no minimum capital requirement for private companies. Over the last 20 years or so, one phenomenon that we witnessed in Europe was cross-border arbitrage with respect to capital requirements. So essentially what this means is many companies from, from, from European, uh, European Union member states with particularly high share capital requirements uh, were actually being formed uh, in other member states. So the classic case of this nature, uh, which is on the slide at the bottom, is a case called Centros, the Centros case before the European Court of Justice back in 1999. Centros were a Danish company. Well, they weren't. So they, they were a Danish business, I should say. All of their business was conducted in Denmark. Their controlling shareholders and directors were both present in Denmark. However, Centros was incorporated in the UK uh, because uh, Centros' controllers basically didn't want to put up a high share capital investment uh, and wanted to benefit from the UK's basically minimal negligible share capital threshold. Uh, the Danish government challenged the case before the, uh, the European Court of Justice the European Court of Justice ruled in favour of Centros and argued that it was fine. What they did was perfectly acceptable within the EU. And what we then saw in Europe over the next 10 to 20 years, we saw a progressive dismantling of share capital requirements, at least with respect to private companies, uh, which means countries like Germany and Austria that have got particularly high requirements are now the exception, I would say, rather than the rule. Uh, Companies obviously need to raise share capital sometimes. Uh, now, uh, one common problem that we sometimes see, especially in startup companies, is something that's that's known as stock watering. Uh, stock watering. Uh, imagine you're forming a company and you need an essential service provided. Maybe you need somebody to provide IT services to get your Wi-Fi up and running and you don't have any money to pay them, what you might say is, well, look, I cannot afford the cash, but what I can do is I can give you free shares in the company. So I'll make you a shareholder for free. So when we start to make profit, you'll have value in your shares. Can you do that? The short answer is yes, you can do it. You are allowed to do that. Certainly under English and AIFC law, you're allowed to do that. As long as the consideration you receive is fair and reasonable, to the company and all its existing shareholders. So as long as the value of the shares you're giving the IT technician in return for their services is broadly commensurate with the market value of, of their services, if they were paid for in cash, you can do this. 
course, if you give them $100,000 worth of shares for doing a job that would only cost you $500 on the market, that would be an abuse of this power. Uh, and therefore, uh, they, that would not be viewed as a, as a valid share allocation. They would therefore be liable to pay up the remainder of that value in that case. A uh, final point to note is payment of, of dividends. Companies will often pay dividends to their shareholders. For many shareholders, that's the key attraction of having shares because that's where you get your, your money from. Um, what happens if companies can't afford to pay dividends? Uh, the one alternative is to, to pay what in the UK we sometimes call script dividends, which is where a script dividend is a dividend paid in the form of new shares in the company. This actually happened in the US last week. Uh, Warren Buffett's investment firm, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, had quite a large investment in Occidental Petroleum, the oil company. Now, as you're probably aware, oil companies around the world are having quite serious difficulties at the moment because of the, the collapse in oil prices. Occidental Petroleum did not have money to pay Warren Buffett cash dividends, so instead, they paid Warren Buffett what, what, in, what in England we would call script dividends, uh, which is basically they paid Warren Buffett in the form of new shares and made him a bigger shareholder instead of giving him cash. You are able to do that. You can do that under English law and therefore by implication, you can do that under AIFC law. Uh, uh, the, the, the other alternative is to, to pay what's called drip dividends. This is when all of terminology gets very strange. DRIP, D-R-I-P, basically means uh, a dividend, uh, a dividend uh, repayment investment plan. Uh, and that's when instead of issuing new shares in the form of dividends to a shareholder, you actually, as a company, you buy back shares from existing shareholders to pay to that particular person. Investors generally prefer DRIP dividends to script dividends because they don't involve issuing new shares. Because as soon as you issue new shares in a company, you dilute the shareholding of existing shareholders, which, which, which the existing investors don't want. Uh, there's also a, a, a doctrine of, of UK and AIFC law called preemption rights. So if you allot new shares in the company to one shareholder, you have to give all other shareholders a 14-day window in which to subscribe for shares as well so that you try and maintain an equal balance of shareholdings. So obviously, you know, buying back existing shares to give to shareholders is a way to do that. And related to that, I should say, companies are able to buy back their own shares. As long as they're not buying back shares out of their nominal capital, as long as they're buying back shares out of profit of the company, they're able to do that. Companies will often buy back their shares, particularly if they want to try and manage the share price of the company. So uh, if a company uh, is under pressure from its shareholders to pay dividends or under pressure, more likely it would be under pressure to increase its earnings per share. One way the company can do that is by buying back some of its shares. So it, it pays some of its shareholders a market price or an above market price typically for their shares, so they're happy. And in respect of the remaining shareholders who do not have their shares repurchased, they've then got a bigger amount of profit to share between themselves because there's fewer shareholders and therefore their shares should in theory be worth more too. So if a company on a market announces a buyback or repurchase program, usually you can be, uh, you can be quite certain that its share price will increase because that will be seen as attractive from the point of view of investors. The final point to note just before I finish is the danger of companies paying what are called disguised distributions. So uh, perhaps you form a company and your spouse, whether it's your, your husband or wife, uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, they're also named as a director of the business. You might decide to pay them uh, a salary from the company. So you form a company, you name an associate as a director, and you pay them a salary, and there can actually be tax benefits to doing that in certain jurisdictions. Uh, now, uh, 
There's a danger, though, if that person is doing nothing for the company, they're not actually doing any work. There is a danger that that can be viewed as a disguised distribution of profit. Now, if the company is profitable, that's fine. But if the company is not profitable, you will effectively have paid them a return of capital out of the company's nominal capital, which you're not allowed to do. And therefore, they may be liable to repay that money. As long as the company stays solvent, it should be OK. But if the company goes insolvent, then there could be a problem because a liquidator could potentially ask for that money to be returned because it's basically viewed as a dividend rather than a salary. Because in order to receive a salary, you actually have to do work. If you've not done any work, it's more likely if you're a shareholder, you'll be viewed as receiving a dividend, which you'll have to repay if it's not been properly paid out. So that is basically a whistle-stop tour of corporate finance and capital markets. Uh, I haven't covered nearly remotely everything that I could do in this field, but hopefully I've entertained you for an hour during your lockdown period and maybe given one or two points that you weren't previously aware of or clarified a bit of, of terminology that you can put to some use in your own work. Uh, I'll invite questions and answers in a moment. Uh, just by way of reminder, next week's lecture, uh, same time next week, will be on insolvency and business rescue and restructuring, something that's particularly pertinent at the current moment in time with the, 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 the crisis in world markets uh, from, the, from the COVID pandemic. And also, uh, do please bear in mind uh, our deep dive legal training program, uh, which I'll be running for the, AI, the AIFC court and IAC uh, in September. Uh, corporate law at the AIFC court and IAC responding to the challenges of a post-COVID-19 business landscape. Do please bear that in mind. And uh, I'm, I'm quite sure details will follow about how to sign up for that in due course if you are interested in participating in that. As things stand, it looks like it will be an online course uh, rather than an in-person course because the chances of me making it over to Kazakhstan in September at the moment look fairly limited, but, but who knows what will happen in the next few months. But, but do bear that in mind in any event. So thank you, everybody. Uh, I will now turn the floor over for questions uh, for the, the next few minutes. So uh, I, will, I will just bring up my participant list. Like last week, if you have got a question, please raise your hand virtually. And then, uh, Jeff, if you could activate the relevant person's mic. Uh, I will try as best as possible to find you on the list if you do raise your hand. So I'm scanning down the list at the moment of participants. There are quite a lot of you, so it may take me a while to spot you, but do please raise your hand if there is any issue you would like to, to discuss further or, or ask about. I'm hoping you're all still awake. <laughs> Just to give another few moments if anybody does want to raise anything. Absolutely no obligation, though, because uh, you've endured me for long enough as it is, and you have other things to do at this time in the evening, I'm aware. No, I don't think there are any questions. Oh, yeah, I've got a question from Denaya. Um, good afternoon, Professor. Hello. I actually um, have a question regarding shareholders uh, challenging decisions made uh, by your board of directors. In what yeah. cases they could do that? So, in what cases could shareholders challenge a decision that was made by a board of directors? Right. Is that your? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, when could they challenge decisions? Uh, it really depends. Uh, the, I mean, obviously, if the shareholders and directors are the same people, then the situation's more straightforward because the shareholders in their capacity as directors will have joint rights to manage the business. But if the shareholders are not directors, then things become more difficult. Now, under AIFC law, Shareholders in general do not have any right to contest or dispute 
a decision of directors. Shareholders cannot directly override a decision that a board of directors makes. Now, of course, they can fire the board, they can dismiss the board, but that's an extreme option and is very inconvenient. What could shareholders, what else could shareholders do? It really depends on the situation. If the directors are viewed as having committed some sort of impropriety, they may be challenged for making a decision in breach of their, their duties as directors. But to do that, the shareholders would have to show that the directors had some sort of conflict of interest or that they'd acted in a grossly negligent manner or outright neglected the company's interests. Just because as a shareholder you disagree with a decision of a director does not, of course, mean that they're in breach of duty. The other thing a shareholder may be able to do is to petition for something called unfair prejudice. So if you feel that your interests as a shareholder are not being taken into account, and you feel that you are in some way being discriminated against as a shareholder, you could potentially go to court and ask the court for what's called unfair prejudice relief. The problem, though, is that in the vast majority of cases, the court, in response to a petition for relief, will likely only grant a buyout order. So they will make an order that the company buys your shares at a fair price. So if you want to leave the company, that's fine. But if as a shareholder you want to remain involved with the company, then obviously that's not ideal at all. But other than those options, there's not really much else that you're able to do as a shareholder uh, if you disagree with the decision directors have made. Does that help at all? <laughs> Um, yes, thank you, Professor. Thank you. You're welcome. Professor, one more raised hand. Dorian. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. See the other. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. I have a, one question about uh, issue of uh, shares, other, other kind of securities in a AFC. Uh, yeah. So, uh, just for example, when you issue these securities in Kazakhstan environment, you have to uh, register your issue at central bank. So they uh, give you a special number, etc. Here in yeah. NIFC, who does this uh, similar function actually? I cannot figure so, out. So does it yeah. APSA? So they make a register of, because what, yes. what we've seen uh, so far that uh, there is uh, no, no, not, not so much regulation about that. Yeah, I, I mean, my understanding is, I, I mean, the 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 company's registrar uh, in the AIFC is based in AFSA uh, in the Astara Financial Services Authority. So the AFSA registrar uh, would 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 keep a register of shareholders. Now, in private companies where the identity of shareholders does not change much. Uh, that's obviously that's more straightforward. In public companies where shares are traded frequently, that's a more difficult thing to do. Now, uh, maybe in fact we I, I believe we we have the AFSA registrar in attendance at the moment. Uh, Nurka, uh, I don't know if Nurka wants to add anything. Uh, if he's still here, to what I've said. I'm here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, if it's a private company, that will be me. Uh, if it is a public company, it could be me. Uh, it depends. If the company is... A, because you can register POC, but don't list your shares or don't go public. You still can be uh, registered in the form of uh, POC. Not all POC have their securities listed and admitted to trading. Uh, if you would like uh, POC to uh, shares being admitted to listing the official list and trading, then uh, there is a dematerialized investment rules, uh, which administered by uh, registrar, uh, which says that uh, 
authorized market institution, which is in our case AX and AXCSD, Astana Investment, uh, Astana International Exchange, they will actually handle the registration of uh, shareholders of the shares which are admitted on their platform for trading. Uh, in terms of uh, ISIN allocation, uh, I think this was the question who assigned the ISIN. There is a consensus between uh, AIX and uh, Central Kazakhstan Central Depository, uh, KCD, uh, which is located in Almaty. And there, the, the single number in agency in Kazakhstan, there is ANNA uh, International uh, Organization, which is a point all the number of agencies in different jurisdictions and allocates the bunches of ISINs and then this uh, local number of agencies allocate this ISIN further down to particular companies. So that will be done by KCD to the entities within AFC as well. Uh, the process is working and straightforward. Does it help? So, uh, it, so it, it could uh, or it could be a central depository here. Both, 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 both ways are working. Is that right? I, I missed the, the first half of the, of the... No, actually, uh, actually, the thing is that uh, uh, when you try to register uh, issue of shares, you have to go to AFSA. This is this that that's first uh, thing. Depends. Depends. If you are listed entity, then you no. go to authorized market institution because authorized market institution is uh, the one. So uh, authorized market institution they can uh, register the issue of your yeah. shares yeah. or your or your bonds. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yeah, could they offer we'll... that? Uh, is there any, uh, as you know, in Kazakhstan, we have special uh, companies who uh, who just make the register of uh, shares, of bonds, etc. Who are specialized companies. But there are no such specialized companies in in AIFC. Yeah, this is KCD. In Kazakhstan, this is KCD, central depository, right? Uh, so they, they were merged with a single registrar was the before last year. Now it's only KCD and KCD will allocate ISIN for companies which are listed on AX as well. Mm -hmm. So they, they can they can uh, make okay and understand. So they can uh, uh, there there is a, a, a rules issued by KCD on allocation on ISIN and there is a uh close saying that ISINs will can be allocated either to companies which are listed on Cassier or in other uh exchanges in in, in financial center. So so that okay that now it's now I understand. Thank yeah. you. No. Thank you, Nurka. Welcome. <laughs> Any other questions before we, we we finish this session? I don't see any other hands. So thank you, Nurkat, for for doing my work for me. Uh, thank you to, to 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 those of you who who ask questions. I don't think there's any more hands. So probably an opportune time to bring this session to a close uh, to to let you go on with your evening. So thank you, everybody. It's been a again. It's been a Pleasure speaking with you uh, and enjoying some virtual company during the, during the lockdown period. Uh, please uh, tune in again next week for our, uh, our, our lecture on insolvency and restructuring. Oops, I just missed uh, somebody. Askar, Askar, do you have a question? Askar, please. Hi. Hello. Uh, are you still there, Oscar? Hello, do you hear me? I do hear you now, yes. Yeah. Hello.
Uh, excuse me. Uh, thank you very much for your for your lecture, Mister. Well, I have a question regarding minimal share capital. Sure. I understand that in English law and the AFC law there is no minimal share capital requirement, but we know that uh, some countries, including Kazakhstan, have such requirements. And yeah. uh, what do you think uh, are pros and cons uh, having such requirements regarding share, minimal share capital? And because we have now uh, some reforming of our corporate law, therefore yeah. we just need uh, to know such cons and pros. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you my honest personal opinion. My honest personal opinion is that there's not much value in having a minimal share capital requirement today. Uh, now, in theory, in theory, the main advantage to having a high minimal share capital requirement is because it provides more security to creditors of the company. So if, for example, you have a minimum share capital requirement of $50,000, let's say, uh, creditors know that at some point in time, the founders of that company have put $50,000 of their own money in, or at least at some point in time, investors have put that money into the company. Now, uh, if that £50,000, sorry, $50,000, let's use US currency, if that $50,000 was locked in the company and could not be paid out, then it would be valuable because creditors know that that money is there. However, share capital can, and to be honest, should be capable of being paid out in the course of business. So companies will have spent that money most likely. If a company is in liquidation, if a company has gone insolvent, it is most likely that it will already have spent its share capital trying to save the business. And most people would say that's what it should be spending it for because companies raise money to fund their business. So, you know, in what we found in the UK, one of the reasons that, that, that we don't worry about having a low share capital requirement, a non-existent share capital requirement really for, for private companies is because we never really feel that share capital provides that much security to creditors anyway. Banks, professional creditors who are lending money to the company will ask for security anyway and will protect themselves through other means. Uh, now, you might say there's still an argument for having a high minimum share capital when it comes to protecting other creditors. So for example, if I'm a trade creditor and I've provided goods to a company or I've done services for the company and I've not been paid, well, I probably don't have any rights of security against the company. So therefore, I might stand to benefit more from share capital. But actually, in the vast majority of cases where share capital becomes important because the company's in financial difficulty and its creditors need repaid, the money's not there anyway. That's certainly our experience in the UK. Uh, with public companies, I think it's different. I think there is a stronger argument for having a high minimum share capital for public companies, simply because if you're going to issue your securities to a public market and you're going to ask ordinary investors like you and me to buy shares in that company, we need to have the assurance that the founders or promoters of that company have put their own money down as a, as, as a, as a, as a cushion. I think for public companies, it, the, investors need the security. Arguably, investors need the security of knowing that the founders have put their capital on the line. But for private companies, I don't see the argument being so strong. But again, that's my personal opinion. Uh, I think share capital is overrated. Uh, and you will probably hear most lawyers in this country, in the UK, say the same thing. If you were to ask a German lawyer, they would probably give you a very different answer to that question, but personally, that would be my opinion on it. Thank you very much. It is exactly my point that uh, there's maybe in closed companies, there's no need to have yeah. such minimum share capital. 
Thank you very much. I agree. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. I don't see any other hands, so I think uh, I will I will leave you to get on with your evenings. Thank you again. I look forward to seeing you next week. Again, please remember the training program that the AFC Court are running in September. I'd love to see you there as well. Uh, and uh, other than that, I will I will see you next week. So enjoy your weekend. Hope you continue to survive lockdown like me. And most importantly, I hope you all stay safe and well over the next week. So thank you, everybody. Good evening. Goodbye. Thank you, Professor. Goodbye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.